Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force talks about the Chinese alloy that made its way into American F-35s. And a look at some of the experimental technology Marines are testing for staying alive and staying supplied in the field. Plus, a final send-off for a legendary 101st Airborne soldier who jumped into France on D-Day. Also, the South Africans take a step forward in military aircraft manufacturing. Find out where they're sending new planes. And what's the U.S. position in the event that China threatens to invade Taiwan? A top DOD official tells us more. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. We begin this week with headlines from around the military, starting with the devastating fire that destroyed the amphibious assault ship Bahan Richard. The trial for the sailor accused of starting the blaze that destroyed the ship started recently in a military trial in San Diego. Seaman apprentice Ryan Sawyer Mays faces arson charges that could lead to decades in prison but the case isn't straightforward. A report into the blaze found a laundry list of fire prevention and suppression failures that implicated a range of Navy personnel as possibly at fault. And at one point, a Navy hearing officer said the force didn't have enough evidence to charge the young sailor. The trial continued this week. Veterans could see their benefits boosted by the biggest margin in decades, following a new plan to guarantee veterans' checks see the same cost of living increases as Social Security payouts. For 2023, that bump could add up to an increase of 8.7% in cost of living adjustments, based heavily on inflation data. If that estimate holds true and the new congressional plan passes, that would be the largest annual increase since 1981. A legendary Army paratrooper received a fitting send-off recently when more than 500 active duty soldiers attended his funeral in Ohio. Jim Pee Wee Martin jumped into Normandy, France on D-Day and went on to fight in some of the most iconic battles of World War II, including Operation Market Garden in the Netherlands and the Battle of the Bulge, the last major German offensive on the Western Front. The 101st Airborne Division veteran jumped back into Normandy on the 70th anniversary of D-Day in 2014 at the age of 93. Martin lived to be 101 and died in mid-September. He was laid to rest in Dayton, Ohio. On a lighter note, a sailor in Washington state is never going to hear the end of it from his shipmates after he was caught by state troopers using a stuffed duffel bag as a fake passenger to gain access to the carpool lane. In a photo posted by the trooper, the sailor is seen caught with the duffel, packed with blankets and topped with a hat after he was pulled over for using a dummy in the HOV lane. Hey, he took a shot. Next up in our series of profiles of Warrior Games athletes, we meet a Marine who came back from injury to compete in a range of sports at the annual competition and who comes with a message for other service members in need. I'm uh, Staff Sergeant Michael Scott, one and only, extraordinaire. 
<laughs> By trade, I'm a motor transportation operations chief. And luckily for me, um, I still get to continue to do that. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, um, where sports was everything to me as a kid. So um, playing stuff like hockey, basketball, football, you name it. Um, and then after my injury, uh, I kind of felt like all that would go away. But then with adaptive sports and what, you know, the Marine Corps and the Warrior Games, what they have to offer, uh, pretty much fills that void. It brings you right back into that competitive fire. On my left knee here, I tore all the ligaments in my left knee. Um, so now I have reconstructed uh, bio joints. Uh, pretty much just like fishing line, plastic pieces. I have no hardware, I'm not ace hardware. I'm doing pretty well with that. I don't set off metal detectors, so it's nice. I was playing football, uh, planted to make a move, and my leg just stayed still and everything kind of rotated uh, awkwardly. Physically, you have to accept that your injury's there. What happened, happened. But then you have a whole new battle of the mental game, emotional game. Um, and I will say the number one thing that gets you through it is the support of friends, family, and coworkers. Anybody you keep close, you, you have to have faith. You ha like, and I don't mean you know, only in God or anything like that. Um, you just have to have faith in yourself. You, you really have to dig deep and just be like, hey, it's all here now. Let's push past it. So break the barrier and get through it. Beyond being just a Motor T operations chief, I'm also a suicide intervention guy for the Marine Corps. Um, and that's something I keep close to my heart. So I use that same kind of mentality for the other warriors that are here on the team with me or that are in the battalions or that I just come across. There's no reason that anybody should turn a blind eye to one another. Um, we should be one team, one fight, no matter the branch either. We should always have someone in our corner. So you always have to just try and you know, match that persona, match that fire and give them something to work with. You, sometimes you gotta reignite someone's fire so that they can grow like a big flame. You know, and everybody wants to party around a bonfire. Um, my brother in 2019, um, he had committed suicide. Um, after battling his demons for years, um, he, he went ahead and took his own life and it clicked to me that why sit around and, and, and have that guilt? Why sit there and turn to something that could be aggressive in someone's life like alcohol, drugs, and X, Y, Z? Why not try to make something better out of it? So that's what I did. I took a negative impact and made it positive and became a suicide intervention guy so that I could better everybody around me. At the Warrior Games, I'm competing in powerlifting, which I just finished. Thank you. Uh, and then I've got archery. I'm a recurve shooter. And then I do seated volleyball and wheelchair basketball. Doing the Warrior Games for any athlete out here, um, it gives you that drive that passion, that fire. When you feel like you're out of the fight for X amount of time, um, it helps you get back into that and that rhythm, that feeling that you have a purpose. Um, it's honestly the most inspirational thing to watch too. Um, so I, like I said, I would recommend for any athlete out there that when you think you're down, something like the games will bring you back up. When we come back, top stories from around the defense contracting world and a look at new tech the Marines are exploring for use in field operations. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. The defense industry doesn't take a day off and neither do the headlines. To look at the latest contracting news, let's head into this week's Defense Dollars. A South African company has sold nine short takeoff and landing Maori aircraft to multiple air forces. Paramount Group, the planes manufacturer, made the announcement Wednesday during the Africa Aerospace and Defense Expo. The company added that the plane is used for reconnaissance and precision strikes, and that it can carry multiple systems. The company did not provide contract values or customers for the Maori, but did tell Defense News that one is an African Air Force. The much-anticipated B-21 Raider bomber will be unveiled to the public for the first time in early December. The Air Force Acquisitions Chief Andrew Hunter told reporters that other details of the rollout are still being finalized. 
It will be the first time the Air Force has unveiled a new bomber since the B-2 Spirit's November 1988 debut at Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. The B-2's first flight took place on July 1989. The new Northrop Grumman-made bomber so far has only been glimpsed in concept art. Its first flight is expected to come sometime in 2023, a few months after the rollout. Northrop said in a press release that after Hunter's announcement that the date of the first flight will be set based on the results of ground tests. There are now six B-21 test aircraft being assembled at Northrop Grumman's Palmdale facility. Greece is working to ramp up its domestic drone industry, which has lagged behind other European countries, with the development of the locally made Archytas aircraft. Hellenic Aerospace Industry presented the vertical takeoff and landing drone for the first time at the Thessaloniki International Exhibition earlier in September. Billed as a multi-purpose drone, Archytas is capable of operating in both rescue and military operations. The company says it can be used to provide situational awareness of the land and sea borders of Greece to monitor ground vehicles, but also to accompany frigates as it has the ability to immediately detect unmanned marine vehicles moving at high speeds. The U.S. Army awarded L3 Harris and Raytheon Applied Signal Technology Phase II contracts to develop sensors in support of a next-generation airborne intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance program known as Hades. The Army says the latest other transaction authority agreements for the high accuracy detection and exploitation system total $18 million. The overall value of the prototyping project over the course of three phases is $49 million. During the competitive second phase, the two defense firms will advance designs and build electronic and communications intelligence sensors that are both more sensitive and more capable of working at higher altitudes, ranges, and speeds. The U.S. Air Force B-52H Stratofortress bombers just wrapped up Bomber Task Force Europe, a month-long training mission in the United Kingdom. This time around, the planes flew with NATO allies and partner countries. They were escorted by Norwegian F-35s and flew training missions with Balkan allies around their peninsula. The goal of the mission? They wanted to get to better know European airspaces and Allied air forces. NATO says the B-52 is a long-range deterrent because it can fly long-endurance missions and carry a wide spectrum of ordnance. So the B-52 is one of our uh, most capable air force assets and is capable of launching and employing uh, almost every single weapon type that the Air Force is uh, capable of using. Everything from uh, maritime support through mining operations to standoff weapons and uh, smart precision guided munitions for air to ground employment. And in news from the recent Air and Space Forces Association Conference, Air Force Chief of Staff General C.Q. Brown talked about the ramifications from the discovery of Chinese alloy in American F-35s. Here's what he had to say about the discovery and how the U.S. sources rare minerals. So particularly uh, to the F-35, um, you know, the, the magnet that was in question doesn't transmit uh, info or harm the integrity uh, of the aircraft. I've had a chance to talk to uh, Lock Lockheed Martin leadership about uh, a little bit about this as well. Uh, there's no performance or quality uh, risk that are associated with it, and the flight ops of the in-service fleet isn't impacted. Um, from a broader standpoint, whether it's uh, minerals or the like, but I do, I do think we as a, as a nation with allies and partners are all looking at our supply chains of where our supplies come from. COVID has probably all taught us a bit of a lesson or two about that. Uh, current events also teach us a few lessons about this, and so it's, for all of us, it's taking a hard look of where we get our supplies from and understand that and what the impact might be, particularly if you're going to go into a, a crisis, contingency, or a conflict. The better we understand that today, the better posture we'll be in the future, um, and, and that's something we got to focus on. Next up, in this week's Mill Tech, the Marines are known for being adaptable and creative. So what are some of the advancements they're trying out to improve everything from command and control to logistics operations? Can someone say autonomous forklift? 
Todd Sal brings us more. Marines recently showcased some experimental technology they're working on to assist the Corps' new redesign of its force for a new mission. And I'm not talking about better ways to get Copenhagen to the field. Over the past few years, Marines have taken big steps restructuring infantry units, both large and small. They've also shed legacy systems such as tanks in favor of a smaller footprint. But to have small units, such as platoons or even squads, running and gunning on far-flung islands, they'll need tech to make it happen. And though the big media splash comes with weapons from rifles to planes to ships, the niche level work the Marines are doing means gritty details such as keeping small units alive and supplied that mean maybe more than just ever before. Jarheads with 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force recently finished off a year-long experiment with the Office of Naval Research on just that goal. Marines are looking at the following areas. Experimental logistics, think 3D printing and new fuel sources. Signature management, think both real and virtual camouflage hiding in plain sight under canopy, but also masking or spoofing digital signatures from communications to cyber to space-based assets. And of course, command and control, talking, sending data, and managing disparate units across vast stretches of the theater such as the Pacific. One example Marine official shared took members of the distribution platoon with Combat Logistics Battalion 8 and had them use Expeditionary Modular Autonomous Vehicle, or the EMAV, an unmanned quadcopter, and a multi-purpose expeditionary platform, an autonomous forklift basically, as part of convoy operations and standalone resupply. Sounds great to me. I don't miss unloading pallets of containers or driving broke down Humvees around the woods to drop off water and chow. The tech they're using enables other tactics or approaches such as fueling the fight. Rather than a helicopter, one big, usually manned target for enemy forces, the experimenters are using multiple smaller quadcopter drones to resupply units in bits and pieces. That way, if one of those quadcopters goes down, the rest of the flow of drones can finish that resupply. And, most important of all, no Marine is lost when that replacement drone meets its fiery end. Military Times saw early experiments with this hive mind drone concept a few years ago at Quantico. That hive mind idea came from a Marine Reservist Logistics Officer who had been inspired by the then new work on drone delivery by Amazon. The recent ONR experiments tested brand new equipment in specific settings. The Corps has also run a series of standard exercises known as Island Marauder. Those Island Marauder exercises conduct typical insertion, attack, and extraction in the Pacific Theater, basically what infantry Marines always do. But Marines have added in not yet fielded tech, or recently fielded tech, to see how that gear might help Marines on current and future missions. In last year's iteration of Island Marauder, they added the Network on the Move light utility vehicle. It's a way for as few as two Marines to jump on a small all-terrain vehicle in an austere site and then send and receive encrypted data or communications as the mission unfolds. So you can see it's all about getting lighter, faster, and putting more deadly tools in the hands of squad-level Leathernecks. Follow us as we track all things lighter and faster and deadlier. Think Marines, here at Military Times. This has been Todd South. When we return, our personal finance expert gives tips on how to harness your military benefits in this week's Money Minutes. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you pointers on getting the most out of your military financial benefits. Deployments and frequent moves can be tough for military families and their finances. Taking advantage of military benefits, whether you're active duty or a veteran, can help ease the strain of inflation, reduce debt, or bump up the savings on housing, education, or retirement. For active duty service members, major credit card companies can sometimes lower interest rates or even provide 0% interest on your existing credit card balances or new purchases while you're deployed. Active and former service members can also benefit from a no-money-down mortgage from the Department of Veteran Affairs and pay no private mortgage insurance. The VA loan must be for primary residences only and can even be used for newly constructed homes. For your education, if you serve 90 days of active duty after September 10, 2001, you, your child, or your spouse are eligible for a maximum of 36 months to go to college at reduced tuition costs with the post-9-11 GI Bill. Bottom line, don't leave money you've earned and deserve on the table. Use your military benefits to help you achieve what's most important to you now and for your future. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. 
To get more coverage of military and defense issues, navigate on over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more stories. And don't forget to subscribe to our Early Bird Brief for top headlines in your inbox every weekday. And get the latest on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And when we come back, a look at the threat of China and how it relates to U.S. posture and politics in the region. Check out a highlight from this year's Defense News Conference. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. The complications posed by China's regional and global ambitions are only set to grow stronger. That's according to a top Pentagon official with vision on the region. Recently, Colin Call, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, stopped by the Defense News Conference to talk about China and other issues. Here's some of what he had to say. I wanted to jump right in um, we're, we happen to be in kind of an, an interesting moment in the Indo-Pacific right now. Um, you know, let's call it the, the, the post-Nancy Pelosi visit um, period. Um, we've seen China's aggressive military activity in the Taiwan Strait since then. Um, so, you know, I wanted to get your assessment from where you sit in the department. Do you think that we're seeing uh, China's playbook right now for a future invasion of Ukraine? Or of Taiwan. I, I mean, sorry, of Taiwan, sorry. Be quite a feat. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I think, I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, I do think we know that um, China is trying to reset the status quo. Um, so I think, look, I think China took the excuse of the speaker's visit, frankly, to do a bunch of things they were likely to do at some point anyway. Um, so obviously in the immediate aftermath of her visit to the island, um, you know, they did a lot of live fire exercises, missiles flying over Taiwan, missiles, you know, flying uh, adjacent to Taiwan into Japan's EEZ, a lot of naval activity. Um, they. Uh, there was a tremendous increase in the number of, of so-called centerline uh, incursions, so the kind of de facto dividing line between the mainland and the island. Um, a lot more in, uh, incursions relative to the historical norm. And so I think, I think what China was trying to do is to demonstrate that, um, you know, to, is to assert uh, a new status quo in which uh, they can coerce uh, Taiwan, uh, in which they are uh, less respectful of, of uh, you know, the international uh, norms and laws which govern uh, transit through the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and trying to send a signal, not just to Taiwan, not just to us, but to other, uh, other uh, countries in the neighborhood. I, I frankly think um, it's, it's not gonna work. Um, and I think in many respects, it's going to backfire. I think actually, you've seen in the, across the Xi Jinping era that the more that China has been militarily assertive, the more frankly it's backfired. Um, you know, I think, uh, India is in a much different place vis-a-vis -vis China than they were a decade mm -hmm. ago. Australia is in a different place. Uh, uh, Japan has hardened uh, their position. Um, and, you know, we've made clear and we made clear through the tensions uh, in the context of the visit that we're going to continue to operate and fly and sail wherever international law uh, permits. I think you probably noticed about 10 days ago we had, uh, you know, two of our uh, naval vessels do a Taiwan Strait transit, uh, and that was after the speaker's visit. So. You know, our, our policy remains the same, which is that we support a free and open Indo-Pacific. We oppose any uh, unilateral change in the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, and we're gonna continue to stand firm uh, with our allies and partners. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.